Welcome to our anti-doping podcast brought to you by UIPM, which is the International Federation of Modern Pentathlon Olympic Sport. Our mission with this podcast is to raise awareness about clean sport and provide pentathletes, their coaches, fans with the latest insight on anti-doping. I'm Thomas and uh, I have a PhD in biochemistry. Alongside me is my colleague Christian, who holds a PhD in pharmacy. We are both anti-doping experts dedicated to promoting clean sport. In this podcast series, we'll focus on prohibited substances and the rational use of dietary supplements, offering valuable information to help you navigate these complex topics. Hello everyone and welcome back to our anti-doping podcast. Uh, today we are diving into two popular and often misunderstood topics, SARMs and creatine. These two substances are used by athletes and fitness enthusiasts for very different reasons and each come with its own set of potential benefits and risks. Joining me to discuss this in detail is my colleague and fellow expert Christian. Thank you for being here, Christian. Thank you, Tomasz. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Um, there's a lot of information and a lot of misinformation out there about both SARMs and creatine and it's a great opportunity to set the record straight. Okay, so let's start with SARMs or Selective Androgen Receptor Modulators, which sounds quite easy, right? Quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, are there any cases in uh, pentathlon regarding SARMs? Yes, actually there are. There are two cases that were reported in 2021. The first case is involving a Russian athlete called Daniel Kalimulin, who tested positive for ligandrol in out-of-competition test. What are actually the reasons why would an athlete take a substance like this? Well, SARMs are strong anabolic compounds. They can help athletes recover faster from the exercise and they also can improve muscle mass as well as muscle strength. SARMs were first developed in the late uh, 90s uh, and at that time they were like seen as a breakthrough in hormonal therapy, especially in the field of male reproductive and the chronology. Um, could you explain why SARMs were considered so promising and a great alternative to conventional steroids? Absolutely. Um, unlike testosterone, which is the, the main compound in anabolic uh, steroids, SARMs aim to target specific tissues, such as muscle and bone, without affecting other tissues, for example, like the prostate, because taking testosterone has a lot of negative side effects on the prostate. And this tissue selectivity was supposed to reduce the unwanted side effects, which were typically seen with steroids, such as prostate enlargement or hair loss. And what about the second case? Well, the second case involved an athlete from USA, uh, his name was Logan Story, and he tested positive for two SARMs, Osterine and uh, Ligandrol, as well as metabolic modulator called GW1516. Another uh, great uh, name for a substance. <laughs> um, so far with this described why uh, these substances were uh, created uh, and why would athlete benefit. Uh, from them, but it's not that ideal, I would say. Uh, so let's move to some adverse uh, effects, uh, side effects, and why athletes should be careful. While SARMs do have promising characteristics, clinical trials, ha trials have revealed some, some limitations as well as risks, especially for long-term use. For instance, SARMs have been linked to liver toxicity, or so-called hepatotoxicity, which is a significant safety concern. The liver toxicity isn't the only side effect. Uh, SARM also have other potential health risks. Yes, there are multiple concerns. SARMs have been shown to lower HDL, which is a good cholesterol. Uh, and by doing this, uh, they increase cardiovascular risk over time. They can also negatively impact impact tendons, uh, making them more susceptible to ruptures, especially in people who engage in uh, intense physical activity, so our pentathletes. Uh, additionally, SARMs suppress natural testosterone production by interfering with uh, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, 
leading to symptoms like fatigue, mood swings and decreased libido. Now it doesn't sound that, that great and that positive so, as we have uh, listed some dangers and uh, side effects. Um, but SARMs are increasingly popular among athletes and even with the general public. Why do you think that is? Um, I think that it might be largely due to how SARMs are being marketed, especially on social media. Many SARMs products are sold as dietary supplements and they are portrayed as safe alternative, alternatives to steroids. And these influencers on the social media often highlight the muscle gains but downplay the risks of SARMs. It's also worth noting that a lot of SARMs are sourced from unregulated markets, including online stores where product quality can be very inconsistent. How is it even possible that a substance which is not approved for human use is in like clinical trial and in research uh, and it's on the market as well? I would say that in some countries the legislation isn't strict enough and these uh, producers of SARMs have found the loopholes and the grey area in the legislation to actually make it possible for SARMs to appear on the market. Yeah, we have also looked at some um, studies about uh, mislabeling of uh, these products. And for, for instance, one study found that only about 50% of products labeled as SARMs actually contained the compounds they claimed uh, to. Some even had other substances like growth hormones um, or other hormone modulators which come with their own side effects. And I think that this is crucial for uh, our pent athletes to understand that the risk is not only about SARMs themselves, but it's also about other substances which can be present in the product. Yep, and to add on it, many of these products are distributed by criminal networks or unregulated online retailers who often change their web domains, for example, to avoid law enforcement. So there's law, law enforcement involved in these uh, criminal networks and the uh, selling of these products. And it's a very risky situation for consumers, especially because the, the long-term safety profile, as we have discussed, is still unknown in these substances. So to sum up, SARMs um, might offer some physical enhancements, but the risk, especially in unregulated environments, far outweigh the potential benefits from my perspective. So more research is still needed to fully understand their long-term effect. Absolutely, Tomasz. My advice to anyone considering SARMs would be to think really carefully and weigh the potential risks. Until SARMs are fully researched and regulated, they remain a high-risk choice for our pentathletes. Yeah. Thank you, Christian, for this last uh, remark. SARMs are far from being the magical bullet that some might think. Uh, thank you for breaking down the science behind it and the risk uh, for uh, our listeners. And now we can switch the gears and talk about something a bit but different, but equally popular in the fitness world, and uh, it's uh, creatine. Uh, creatine is a supplement that has been around for a, for a while. Uh, it has been studied uh, a lot. And while it, it, it just built a reputation as one of the most effective and safe sport uh, supplements. Christian, can you start by explaining what creatine is and uh, what it does in the body? Of course. Creatine is a natural compound that is, that's made up of three amino acids. Uh, it can be produced in our bodies. It is primarily stored in skeletal muscle, well, where it plays a crucial role in energy production. Uh, during short, intense bouts of exercise, this substance can actually help to regener regenerate energy in the form of ATP, which is an abbreviation of adenosine triphosphate. And that's the, the main energy source for muscle contractions. So you have, you have said that creatine is produced by our body on its own. Uh, so is a supplementation of creatine necessary for everyone or it depends on your uh, sports goal or what's, what's the reasoning behind that? Most people get creatine from their diet 
especially if they eat uh, meat or animal products. But dietary intake usually only saturates muscle creatine stores up to about 60, maybe to 80 percent. Uh, taking a creatine in the form of dietary supplement can help reach full saturation and therefore it is beneficial for athletes who are involved in high intensity activities. When we were preparing for this podcast, we, we checked on the web pages that there are uh, so many new forms of creatine uh, and the claims and the advertisement is quite robust, stating that these new forms of creatine are much better, they have better absorption, they can really, really endure your performance, increase your, your power. Um, and it's much better than old-fashioned monohydrate. What would you say to that? Well, I would say that creatine monohydrate is still the most studied and effective form. It has been studied in more than thousand studies. So we certainly know that it is effective and we know that it is also safe. And these new forms of creatine often claim better absorption and other things that you have already mentioned, but there's very little scientific evidence to support these claims. So in the current state of the art, I would say that creatine monohydrate remains the gold standard. The second uh, thing we observed uh, when we were checking the internet is that uh, a lot of other substances are added to uh, creatine, like vitamins, minerals, maybe some caffeine or some other stimulants. So, is it good to combine it in one product or what should be the advice to our band athletes? I don't really see any logic in combining creatine monohydrate with anything else. I would say if you are taking just the plain creatine monohydrate, you're good to go. How actually creatine can affect the energy for muscles? I would like to make it simple. So. Creatine is essential for phosphagen system and that's the system that quickly regenerates energy in our muscle cells. So creatine helps to produce ATP and that's the main source of energy for our uh, muscles. And this system, the phosphagen system, is very useful for those short high intensity exercises, for example like fencing in pentathlon. So creatine really seems to enhance performance, particularly in high intensity sports like fencing. But uh, what about um, endurance athletes? It really depends. I think that there are some benefits for um, endurance athletes as well. Creatine can help during high intensity intervals in sprints of the endurance events or at the start of the activity of the endurance event. However, it's primarily beneficial for athletes who rely on explosive power. So I would say that fencing would be the, the main sport out of the pentathlon that the creatine would make the most sense. What about safety? Is it safe? Is it not safe? Uh, should uh, pentathletes be careful? And what would be your advice on that? Generally, as we have discussed, creatine is safe. It has been proven in more than 1,000 studies. It does have some mild side effects, and the most common one is weight gain, and that's mostly due to increased water retention in the muscles. Some people also experience mild digestive issues, especially when they are taking high doses of creatine. And additionally, because creatine breaks down to creatinine, a met metabolic product, uh, which is also used to assess kidney function, so it could be seen as a biomarker. There is a misconception that creatine harms the kidneys, however, that's not the case, and it has been proven that creatine doesn't affect actually kidney health. Another issue is the dosage. Uh, if uh, an athlete decides to take the supplement, uh, what would be your advice about dosing? Because uh, there are many approaches. Uh, it can be just one dose uh, per day or you can uh, make some splits. So what's your point? Well, a standard dosage would be five grams per day and that is most effective for most of the people. Uh, there's no need for a loading phase 
that is seen of the, on the many uh, label claims on the products. But if someone really wants to get quick results, they can start with 20 grams per day and then they um, get the maximum benefit of the creatine in maybe five to seven days. You do not take 20 grams in one serving, you have to split it in four doses. But if you are a patient, you just take five grams per day and after a month, you're good to go. So I think that when we compare uh, creatine to experimental substances like SARMs, we can say uh, the creatine is like well-supported and effective supplements from this perspective. Definitely, creatine is one of the few supplements on the market that has proven benefits for physical performance and very low risk profile when sourced from reputable, reputable suppliers. Thank you, Christian, for joining me today and for sharing your expertise on both SARMs and creatine. And thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Remember, it's essential to be well-informed and cautious when it comes to supplementation. Join us next time as we continue to explore topics in sports science and anti-doping education. Until then, stay safe and keep striving for clean, healthy performance. Stay safe until the next time.